Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you that we have the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to come together to enjoy worshiping in your presence, declaring your value in our lives together. Lord, we pray a blessing over every person, every family, every home that is here represented or watching or participating online. Lord, we just thank you for your plans and purposes for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, welcome to church this morning. So glad you're here today. It's the end of tulip time. And uh, we have something special going on this weekend. If you didn't know it yet, um, Pastor Steve Hage is here from California. The last time he came, God moved and we were excited and we realized that we wanted to keep going. So this time we've made provision for that. We're going to have service tonight at 7 o'clock and Monday night at 7 o'clock. Come expecting, invite people to join us. We're going to see God move. Steve, come on up and uh, start this weekend off with the Holy Spirit. So, seven days ago, you were on crutches. I was. He fell off a cliff. And uh, might tell the story, he might not. Now he's going to have to. But um, we put this chair up here in case you wanted uh, a reprieve. All right, thank you. Thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. You good? Yeah, I fell. I was in Mexico uh, on vacation. I hate going on vacation, and now I have an excuse that I don't ever have to go on a vacation again. But um, we were hiking up this hill. It was 40 feet up, straight down. It wasn't like this kind. It was like straight down. And then there was like a ledge, and then there were rocks, and then there was the ocean in Puerto Vallarta. And uh, I grabbed this branch to go around these roots and rocks, and the branch snapped, and I went. And uh, they told me that I went through three boulder formations. (laughs) It just kind of zigzagged. Instead of hitting them, I went like that. And, uh, and then before I flew off into the rocks, I hit a tree with the back of my shoulder, like, boom. And one of my preacher friends said, that's the second time a tree saved you. Uh, the first one had Jesus on it. This, <laughs> this one I hit. So um, that was two months ago, and uh, I just got off of crutches. I broke my leg. I broke my nail. And I hurt my shoulder. So, uh, but I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I literally was in a wheelchair. Uh, I, I preached a couple conferences, and I uh, rolled in on a wheelchair. I'm sure that uh, motivated everyone to have faith when the preacher comes in on, in a wheelchair. God's gonna move. Oh, hold on. Where's my crutches? But anyway, uh, so glad to be here. I think this is only the second time I've preached without a cane or a crutch, Uh, so I'm moving a little gingerly, but uh, when the anointing hits, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I want you to understand that there's two sets of responsibility when we do like extended meetings like this. Number one, my responsibility is to come prepared, Uh, prayerfully, intentionally. In fact, pastor called me the other day and he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm actually praying for our time together. He goes, well, that's good. Uh, I'm glad you're praying, (laughs) you know, not just, but um, so my responsibility is to come prepared. Your responsibility is to come expecting. Um, Expectation is the cup that God will fill up. So you could either come with a Dixie cup or you can come with a sparkless bottle or you can come with a swimming pool. Uh, The issue is never God's ability to supply. It's our ability to put a demand on that supply. And so God stands ready to give whatever you need. Uh, And how many of you know that he ain't running out? There isn't, there's enough of God to go around. He is acutely aware of every hair on your head and uh, your light bill, your teenager, 
your unbelieving spouse, your emotional wife. Come on, somebody. God can do all things with all people. Somebody say amen. Amen. So um, you need to come expecting an outcome prepared. The uh, operative word in that statement is come. You need to come. You need to be here. Uh, those of you who are online, I appreciate it. But if you can make it tonight at 7 or Monday at 7, I'm, I think it will be more powerful for you to be in the presence. Although I'm not mad at you uh, experiencing this through the uh, screen, whatever you're watching. But um, let's see if we can't uh, see God do some stuff. Uh, when we set aside and consecrate some time for God... It actually is a magnet for his uh, Holy Spirit to accomplish things in your life. Amen. And the Spirit of God is the accomplishing agent of the Trinity. So it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. God the Father sitting on his throne. Jesus is at his right hand praying that the Holy Spirit will move in our lives. So I believe wherever two or more are gathered in his name, we're not here to praise the praise or worship the worship. We're here in his name. He will be here in our midst. Now, when he comes, everything that he is comes with him. So the provider comes, the peace, the king, the prince of peace comes, the king of kings comes, the healer comes, the provider comes, the encourager comes, the great counselor will come, the one whose government rests on his shoulders will come, the one that the Bible says there shall be no end to the increase, Isaiah 6, 9, I think it is, there shall be no end to the increase of his government or of peace, that's who comes when we gather in his name so I want you to know that it only takes two or three of us I wish I hope that there's going to be more than that but the reality is that when we come together he's here waiting to do for you the Bible says that God knows what you need before you ask him everybody say ask but the power is in the ask the power of, of God is already consistent but what accesses it is the ask The Bible says you have not because you ask not. We are going to ask in these next few services together. We're going to put a demand on God. We're going to believe that there's going to be answers to your questions, solutions to your problems, breakthroughs on things you've been praying about maybe for years. And what if, just what if, this is the weekend God set aside to bust you through your barriers. Amen, somebody? (laughs) To penetrate to penetrate that ceiling you've been hitting your head on for all this time. Maybe this is the time when your prodigal comes home or your teenager goes, I think I want to go to church and and gives their heart to Jesus and gets their name in the book of life. Maybe this is the moment when when that sickness finally dries up and goes away. Maybe this is the day when you get healed from your past and give yourself a break from your memories. Maybe this is the moment. Maybe these are the days that God said, set aside for you you've been believing 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 faithful 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 maybe these next two days are fruitful 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 instead of faithful 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 amen so let's believe God listen you're like well you know the the, I know that this group this crowd isn't like this but the NBA playoffs are on you're like who cares but I do but if I'm here all the way from California you can get authority over the dishes in your sink and you can come amen somebody Amen. You can go to church more than one time in a week. You can, get, you can set aside some time for God to do what he wants to do in your life. The Bible says it's there that God commands a blessing. So the blessing comes there. You just have to be there to get what's there. And if the blessing comes and you're there and it happened there, you better get to where the there is. Amen. And so for the next couple days, this is our there place. So let's make plans. It's at 7 o'clock. I I promise I won't be long-winded because I get sick of listening to myself preach just like you do. But uh, I am believing that the Lord wants to do something special in your life, even if if it's just bringing some encouragement. And will you pray for me that the, the prophetic anointing would hit? I can't manufacture it, but I love to encourage people that way. And uh, I've been in the ministry for 48 years, 
And God has always used me to bring encouragement to people that way. And I would like to be able to have a time when we minister like that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that uh, it's not going to happen, but I'm not saying it, it just kind of happens. And I can't pretend it. Uh, and you don't want me to be uh, pretending words from God over your life. But when it hits, it's real. So um, I want to... Uh, entitled this message, and I really prayed about this, and and I've uh, had this revelation for a while, but um, I kind of revised the way I present this revelation that I'm going to give you this morning, Um, but I want to entitle this uh, Three Satanic Strategies. How many know there's a Satan? How many of you know that he's a liar? How many of you know he's the father of lies? Uh, He can't do anything but lie, and uh, he can't even tell the truth if he wanted to. He's the father of lies. So anytime you sit at the negotiating table with your adversary, he's not telling you the truth. And truth is what sets you free if you know it, not if you hear it. Jesus didn't say you'll hear the truth and the truth will set you free. He said you'll know it. So you got to get truth in your knower. So here uh, we have to understand that we have Jesus who's truth and we have the devil who's a liar. and And the liar who is the devil has strategies that are designed and assigned to sabotage the sentence of success that's on the saints. It's a lot of S's. Try to say it fast. So three satanic strategies that are designed and assigned to sabotage the sentence of success that's on the saints. That's what I'm preaching on today. Um, So just get the tape and play it slow and you'll get it figured out. So first thing I want you to understand is that you are sentenced to success. You are sentenced to success. The judicial arm of heaven has already concluded the hearing on your life. And your life is no longer uh, subject to the wrath or punishment of God. Rather, I think it's 2 Corinthians uh, 2.14 perhaps uh, that says that, uh, that Jesus will always cause us to triumph. He will always cause us to triumph. But thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Everybody say always. Now you always are going to be on the winning side of the game. Now the devil might score a basket on you. You might be down at halftime. But I'm telling you that at the end of the day, your life will consist of winning. You might have losses, but that doesn't make you a loser. Amen? Amen. How many of you know that uh, it wasn't a great day in heaven when uh, the devil, Lucifer, took one-third of the angels and rebelled against God? How many of you know God had losses? He lost one-third of the angels. Yikes. I don't know how you would feel, but if one-third of my church got up and followed the worship leader right out the door because they wanted to be like me, That would be a bummer day. And so God created hell. Told all them guys, go to hell. And they went. (laughs) Amen? So I guess it's okay to tell somebody to go to hell. if if if, Maybe not somebody. Tell the devil to go there. Amen? He's like, he's cussing in church. Yes, I am. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Michigan. Okay, so there's a sentence of success that's on you. But just because you have a loss, how many of you know that God made Adam and Eve? He lost them. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. The very first family raised a murderer. I can't, I don't get it. Like you walked with God your whole life and those are the kind of parents you raised a kid who killed his brother? You got to be kidding me. Losses. Jesus comes, he can pick 12 guys. To advance the kingdom. And what ends up happening? He loses one of them. His name was Judas. Was Jesus a loser? Did he? No. But did he have losses? Yes. And so it just. We have losses in our life. But that doesn't make us losers. We will ultimately win in this game. 
the game of life. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, I love this verse. You're going to love this, Josh. In Ecclesiastes 5.20, it says this, that they seldom reflect on the days of their life because God kept them occupied with the gladness that was in their heart. I don't know about you, but when we get a glimpse of the, of the wind that God has given us in our life and for our life, the reality is that the gladness that, in, that is in our hearts very rarely causes us to go back and investigate and excavate the dead things that are in our life. I don't know why we get a backhoe and dig up an old casket with our old dead self, get a crowbar, open the casket, and start asking that dead corpse for advice. Amen. Your new creation. God has got some new things for you this week. Amen, somebody. So let's be, let's be occupied with the gladness that's in our heart. And lastly, I want to say this before I preach my message. You're like, what have you been doing up there? I'm just fiddling around. But uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has basically already blessed us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everybody say every blessing. Amen. Now it says every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now listen to me on this. <sighs> every blessing from God is spiritual. So it's not just like I feel this spiritual thing. Prosperity is a spiritual blessing. Harmony in your marriage, spiritual blessing. Protection on your children, spiritual blessing. Healing in your body, spiritual blessing. Every blessing from God is motivated, driven by, and accomplished by the spirit. Therefore, it's spiritual. Okay, there's no, there's no such thing as a non-spiritual blessing from God because all of the blessings from God are carried out through the spirit who accomplishes the agenda of the one who sent him okay now it's there in heavenly places well the reason why let me say it like this God's blessings are they originate in heaven but they're not designed to operate in heaven because heaven doesn't isn't a place where you need to be blessed because you're already blessed you're not going to go to heaven and say, man, I just hope God blesses me. You're going to be living in a mansion. Amen? I might even be your butler for all eternity. Who knows what will happen? You know, open the door, I'll be like, hey. But uh, so you never know what, you never know what, uh, let me say it like this. You've got to understand that, that the blessings of God are originating in heaven but they're not designed to operate there they're designed to operate on earth but the reason why they're in heavenly places is so that our opponent can't access your blessing so your blessing is reserved it, you have all of them it's not like you get some you get some you get some no we all get all he's already reserved he's already blessed you with every single blessing every single promise everything that Christ purchased for you on Calvary's cross it's already reserved in heaven for you he's just waiting for you to access it because the devil our opponent can't access it that's why it's in heavenly places not to operate there but for you to access it there how do you access it by faith. How do we know we have faith? We ask, believe, and receive it. That's how you get it. The Bible says, now listen, listen. It, thank you. For, but it's important that you understand that you are deprived of nothing. The reason why we don't have what belongs to us is we don't believe it belongs to us. Everybody say this. Clarity, Clarity. precedes empowerment so people don't have the power of God's blessings in their life because they're not clear about what's theirs it's like your kid begging you for Captain Crunch cereal when it's already in the stinking cupboard please please can you get me some Captain Crunch put some crunch berries in there Right? You're like, why are you asking me for what already belongs to you? 
All you had to do was be born into this stinking family. The Captain Crunch is in the cupboard. I don't know about your kids, but, you know, my kids would just walk in. I'm, I don't know, kids. Yeah, amen. <laughs> kids. Kids, they come down the stairs. You're like, how are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, why'd you get an F on your report card? My teacher's stupid. <laughs> what? They go get the... Captain Crunch, they pour it in a stinking cake mixing bowl, take a half gallon of milk, pour it in there, eat the whole thing, leave the bowl, leave the spoon, leave the empty box, leave the empty milk, and go back upstairs. You're already blessed with every spiritual blessing. So, we have an adversary that wants us to be out of alignment with what belongs to us. So let me break this down to you. You guys okay? Okay. So in Luke chapter 9, and I think it starts at verse 52, if we can put that up there. Um, Jesus is walking along the road. Now, this, we're going we're gonna to evidence uh, three mindsets that keep you, uh, you know, locked in to mediocrity. That cause you to keep hitting your head on the ceiling that caused your life, that cost Jesus his life to give you to uh, negotiate with average. Listen, I'm not mad at anybody, but average is your enemy. We need to be the people that everybody wants to be like. When they look at us, they're like, what do you have that I don't have? Why are you happy in a pandemic? I don't know. Because I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm not rejoicing in the situation. I'm not going to regurgitate limitations. There is no limitation on your life except the one that you manufacture erroneously. So they're walking along the road, and a man comes up to Jesus, and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, that's a pretty noble thing to say. Jesus' reply is very interesting. But this man comes up to Jesus, and he's evidencing uh, the satanic strategy or the limiting mindset that causes him to not experience everything that God has for his life. He says, I want you to understand, Jesus. I will follow you wherever you go. How many of you have realized that as soon as you said yes to Jesus, he starts going places? He'll go right into your past. He'll go right into your fear. He'll go right into your upbringing. Come on, somebody. He'll go right into your alibis and your excuses. I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, what if he goes to your wallet? Okay, no, 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 no. No, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, listen, the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But sometimes the son of man doesn't have any place to lay his head. That there, there are some times in this journey where there are no indicators of hope. There are some times in this journey where you just got to go raw with your faith. There's some times in this journey where it doesn't look like God is even recognizing who you are. Remember David said, how long are you going to hide your face from me? How long are you going to turn your back on me? How long are you going to put distance between me and you? In Psalm 13. So the reality is sometimes we do don't feel it. And here Jesus is saying, listen, strategy number one is making emotional commitments without first counting the cost. When you do that, the Bible says, I think it's in Luke 14, where Jesus said, what man among you when he wants to go build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to finish? Otherwise, when he starts, lays a foundation and he can't finish, his adversaries will ridicule him saying, this person started but couldn't finish. How many Christians start but don't finish? Can't get no help from that side. Let me go over here. <laughs> How many people do you know that said yes to Jesus and trouble came and they left when the trouble came? How many people do you know started walking with God and he didn't turn into their cosmic Santa Claus and then they blew out as fast as they blew in? 
Amen? I mean, Jesus is saying, listen, there's a cost to following me. If you don't count it, you're going to quit. You're going to grow weary in well-doing, which will prohibit you from reaping because you fainted before you got your harvest. And here we have to, listen, you got to understand that this isn't a whipped cream slide into strawberries and peaches, man. Sometimes God goes after stuff in your life that will cause you to feel like he's completely abandoned you. you got to go, hey, do you even know where Holland, Michigan is? God, where are you? Are you counting the cost? It's important that you understand that there is a cost and you got to pray the price and you got to stay in this thing. Quitting always promises us relief. That's why we quit. You think, look, if I just quit, I'm going to get a break. I'm going to dump this fool. Why? Because I just need a break from your immaturity and lack of sophistication. Have you ever, have you ever met somebody... He's really good looking. He feels like Mr. Right, but he's just Mr. Right now. (laughs) Amen? Preach it. Look, she's like, yeah, that's why I'm here at church by myself. (laughs) Because I was with that fool. Amen. I met him at at the honky tonk. (laughs) I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Huh. I was looking for love in too many faces, and then you two-step your way straight to hell, and that's what happens. <laughs> and then, and you, listen, you cannot solve relational issues without some sophistication and some emotional intelligence and some emotional maturity. No woman wants to raise her oldest child. Who's you? Amen? They're cracking up over there like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I married him 10 years ago. I'm still raising him. (laughs) You got to count the cost. Quitting always promises you relief. But it only produces regret from which there is no relief. Don't you quit on God. Well, it looks like he quit on me. You better count the cost. Sometimes you not feeling God and still following God is the very thing you need to get sophisticated and mature in your Christ following. The very thing you're going through is what's essential for you to be the person that you need to be to be able to carry the blessings that belong to you so the blessings don't turn you to powder from your nose to your toes. Everybody say count the cost. Second guy, next verse. Jesus goes up to this guy, pastor. Jesus goes up to him. Says, hey, you follow me. I don't know about you, but that's an honor. Maybe Jesus was trying to recruit this guy to be a disciple. Maybe he was trying to recruit him to do something, to write a book of the Bible. Uh, Who knows? Maybe he was asking him to follow him because he saw something in him that he didn't see in himself. And, and, And sometimes the Lord comes to us. And he says, you follow me. And you're like, "Uh, you know, what will my friends think? What my relatives think? What will my family think? What will I think? What am I going to have to give up to follow you? Come on. I don't get to party anymore with my friends. Well, go ahead. You'll figure out soon enough uh, that that's not the road you want to take. But he, he says, you follow me. And the guy, and the guy says, well, uh, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Everybody say, but first. <laughs> you know, when you have excuses first instead of kingdom first, you're going to be out of alignment for the success that's already belonging to you. So here he says, but first let me go bury my father. And then Jesus responds with what appears to be some insensitivity He says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go proclaim the kingdom of God everywhere. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Second satanic strategy is giving your father fracture first place. 
Now listen to me. I've been in the ministry a long time. I don't know everything. I learned some things today from your pastor having coffee about trauma that I will steal, preach all over America, and not give him a pepper flake of credit. <laughs> You're going to be like, Hage is brilliant. Yes, I am. I know how to steal revelation. But anyway, so, so he says, listen, let me, let me go bury my dad. Every single person I've ever met has some kind of father issue. Everybody. There isn't a person that I met that was raised by a perfect father. You witness some kind of inconsistency. I mean, even my kids. I'm their dad. Even my kids have some things that they pointed out that I didn't do right, which I said, well, that's on you. <laughs> we did a family Zoom call for our channel that we have. OC Summit Church, we did a family Zoom call, and uh, we asked all of our kids, Many, uh, two of them are married, we got five grandkids, da-da-da-da-da, and uh, we said, what are the things that we taught you that you took with you and put into your family, and what are the things that we taught you that you said, there ain't no way I'm putting that into my family, and we started talking, oh boy, I'm like, I'm not showing this. Because they start talking about the mistakes that we made. And I just had to sit there and go, you know what? I'm going to own that. And my son was like, Dad, you did that, and I will never do that to my kids. You, you rescued me from growing because you gave me too much too fast. That's what he told me. He said, my kids are going to learn how to earn you delivered us out of your own issues because you grew up in poverty with food stamps and government cheese. So you didn't want us to feel the pain of lack. So you overcompensated and you raised us through your issue rather than the principles of God. And he's saying this on television. And I'm like, okay, can I have another son, please? <laughs> but everybody's got father issues. Every father makes mistakes. The best we can do is give you 50% and then half have you put your hand in the hand of the man who knows the rest. The best thing you can do is teach your kids how to get a hold of Jesus, and so he'll make up for what you messed up. Amen? So he says, let me, let me go bury my father. I've got father issues. I gotta, and, and Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. Let me tell you something. Father fractures are not qualifiers or disqualifiers for ministry, Jesus said the way out of your pain of your past with your father is you preach your way out of it. He said, let me tell you what to do. He's not interrupting a funeral procession and saying, drop the casket and come be a disciple of mine. What this guy said is that how I feel about the way I was fathered in my own personal appraisal disqualifies me from being ready to declare the goodness of God. I got to go back and figure myself out. And Jesus is like, no, I'm calling you out and you can preach your way out, not figure your way out. Amen, somebody? You don't let anything that happened in your past prohibit you from pursuing with power your future amen somebody I know we were all raised wrong listen everybody's got everybody's messed up everybody needs a savior let's lose our judgments on others and ourselves listen listen I was raised broke busted and disgusted and God found me somehow I don't know how, he, and listen, I had a father who was so messed up, toe up from the floor up, needed a check up from the neck up. But the reality of the way I was raised, I couldn't give it any power to prohibit me from pursuing my purpose. Let me tell you what happens. Your purpose will redeem your pain. The, if you allow your past to prohibit you from possessing your purpose, you'll stay in pain all of your life. Your pain will get redeemed 
by your purpose and then where it hurt, your pain will become the platform of your proclamation rather than the deterioration of your purpose. Come on, somebody. We've got to understand that everybody was raised wrong. I told my wife I was raised so wrong and she said you were raised perfect for what God called you to do. I was like, oh. That's true. Neglected, abused, the things I saw no kid should ever see. The things I faced no kid should ever face. And then for God to pluck me out of that mess, out of that inner city urban life in Los Angeles, California, and survey the landscape of the nation and say, I want you. How? Why? Because of this dad that I had? And somehow, some way, God caused me to preach my way out of it. And let me tell you what happens when you start telling people about Jesus. You'll hit your sweet spot, and you won't even know how you got there. One day, you'll just wake up, you'll be like, dang. Dang. I'm not hurting anymore. I'm not overwhelmed by insecurity and inferiority and comparison and competition and fear of lack and all of the fear of loss. I, like, I lived that way for too long, and then one day you just preach your way out of it like Jesus said. First one, you make emotional decisions without counting the cost. Second one is you give your father fracture first place. Stop letting that be the filter and start letting the goodness of God and the love of God and the call of God on your life, man. And give the devil a stinking nervous breakdown. Amen? I'm not trying to be cliche or cute. I'm saying we can do this. Okay, last guy. So then, go back to Luke 9. So then another guy comes up to Jesus, says, Jesus, I want to follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said, anyone, after putting their hand on the plow, who looks back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Let's talk about this. This guy, first person, first person is about emotions. Well, I love emotions, but emotions are like kids. You don't let them drive, but you don't put them in the trunk either. Unless they're my kids, you just put them in the trunk. No, you don't let your emotions drive. You have, God gave you emotions to experience the world with, but not to let yourself be led by. Emotional decisions never give you the righteous result you're looking for. So emotional commitments, you got to lose the emotions being led by the emotions. I'm not telling you not to feel. I'm just telling you don't be led by how you feel. Look at, look at me. You can choose right and not feel right at the same time. I don't wake up every morning for 42 years and feel married. I don't even know what feeling married feels like anymore. I just am. 42 years of this. Every day, every minute of every day, you're not going to feel married. In fact, I heard my wife singing in the bathroom the other day, Someday my prince will come. I'm like, hey, hey, what about me? True story, she was looking in the bathroom one time. I'm in there getting ready or whatever I'm doing. And she says, hey, Steve. I'm like, yeah. She's like, women are visual too. <laughs> uh-huh. Shut the door. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, what? She's like, you're getting a little out of shape. You're getting a little floppy disky there going on. You're getting a little sloppy floppy. I'm like, oh, geez. She's like, you know, you might want to get in the gym because your arms look like straws. <laughs> I'm like, all right, thanks. True story. True story. It's what motivated me to get back in the gym. <laughs> Not that it's working anyway. 
Second one is you got your father issues. Third one here is that you, the third prohibitor is, I'll be done right now, is that you let your pedigree define your purpose. You get off the plow. Now let's talk about this. The second guy had father issues. The third guy had family, unresolved family trauma stuff. He needed to go say goodbye. He needed to close the door on his past. And Jesus said, if you get on this plow and you get off, you just disqualified yourself. You don't have the fitness and you don't fit like a puzzle piece into the kingdom. So let's talk about this. What's a plow for? And let's talk about that God, Jesus, is likening your purpose to a plow. And so he said, if you get on my purpose and you get on purpose and the plow does what the plow is supposed to do and you get off when the plow is doing what the plow is supposed to do, you're going to miss what God has called you to do, and then when you miss, the miss causes a mess. The reason why we have messes is because we have misses, and the reason why we have misses is we got off the plow, and the reason why we got off the plow is because the plow is doing what the plow does. What does the plow do? The plow locates roots and rocks that are prohibiting the seed from doing what it's supposed to do. Now watch this. So you get on the plow... And all of a sudden, it hits a rock of offense. How many of you know that you can't pursue with excellence your purpose if you're offended simultaneously? Psalm 119, verse 165. I have a first edition Bible page this big of that scripture. It says, those who love God's law will have great peace and nothing shall be able to offend them. Nothing shall be able to offend them. Let me tell you something. Being offended is, can be traced back to us. Stop loving God's law. God's law is the law of love. Okay, so anyway, it hits that rock of offense. It hits a root of rejection, a root of anger, a root of pride, a root of fear. And it just hits it. And here... Right there where it hits that kink, you're just going along with Jesus, and then boom, and it feels like you're stuck. And you're going to be stuck until you let your purpose plow up that rock and that root. But what happens is we start romanticizing our past. I was better before I became a Christian. When I was a Christian, I didn't have to go back into my past and work on all this stuff. I didn't have to get rid of my offenses. I could just be an offended person at the bar and no one would care. In fact, they would join in. Yeah, I can't believe someone would do that to you. And and right there is the temptation to get off and go back. When your purpose is trying to plow through what is prohibiting your purpose from having full expression in your life. And the seed of God's word won't work simultaneously with fear. It won't work simultaneously with anger. It won't work simultaneously with pride and rejection. And those are the roots that try to entangle our purpose and stop us from pursuing our purpose in God. Amen, somebody? So it's vital that you understand, I got to stop, but it's vital that you understand that, that once you get on the plow, stay on the plow. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, stay on the doggone plow. Turn to your other neighbor, other neighbor, I'm talking to you too. Stay on the plow, man. Do not grow weary in doing good. Hold on. The praying power of Jesus is stronger than the pulling, trying to pull you off power of the enemy. You stay on the plow. You stay in this church. You stay committed to this vision. You stay on the plow. Well, I just don't, you know, Josh, stay on the plow. 
Well, my wife, I mean, she's riding me like a doggone bronco. I said, just stay on the plow of your marriage. These doggone kids, they won't die, they multiply. No, just keep parenting your kids. Stay on the plow. Too many people are the blast that didn't last. Can somebody play the piano real quick? Thank you so much. Can you play some La Bamba or something? <laughs> Let me pray for you real quick. I, I got to stop. I know I'm a couple more minutes over. I'll be back tonight, bro. You don't worry about it. I, I never end. I just stop. Pastor told me, he said, now if you run out of things to say, I'm like, do you know who you're talking to? He's like, oh, yeah. Will you just bow your head, close your eyes? Great job. Ask God to, will you just give him, just give him your father fracture? You gotta, it's getting in your way of all the things you're looking for. seat and your purpose has got to get behind the wheel you're here on purpose God made you for a reason and it's not to keep regurgitating regurgitating emotional trauma give it to God I'm not minimizing what happened but it's not what happened you can't get over it's the lie that comes through the door of what happened Interrupt the lie and replace it with purpose. And now I want you to stand strong on that plow. You may feel like you ain't going nowhere. You're not moving anywhere. You've been stuck in one thing for a long time. Let the plow plow up the fallow ground, the hard places full of roots and rocks that are trying to stop you from counting for the kingdom which is your ticket to fulfillment and satisfaction in Jesus name Lord I pray for this house fill it with purpose in the mighty name of Jesus will you all stand with me very quickly wherever you are if you're comfortable take somebody's hand and there's hand sanitizer you can use after the service if you're uncomfortable and look at me you're here today you're not right with God you know all about him but you don't know him it's like I know all about Oprah but I've never met the lady care if I do I'm just saying and some of us know all about Jesus but we don't know him and you're here today you're saying yeah I did know him at one time but I wandered off and now I'm over here trying to do this in my own efforts listen to me God took all of his wrath and all of his judgment and he dumped it out on Jesus on that cross and now there's none left over for you The only thing that's left over for you is purpose and love and passion from God. And you're here today and you're saying, I need to get right with God for the first time or I need to come back to God after being gone sometime. Will everybody pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, today's my day. I'm getting right. Forgive me. Change me. Save me come into my heart write my name in your book of life and even if nobody goes with me still I'm going to follow you I'm never going back to my old life 
in Jesus' name. Now keep holding that hand. If you prayed that prayer, you came to God for the first time or you came back after a long time or some time, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, gently squeeze the hand of the person that you're holding. When, you say, when I say three, you'll just go, boom, that's me. Ready? One, two, you've been waiting for this. Three, squeeze that hand. Just squeeze it gently. Now, if someone squeezed your hand, I'm going to count to three again. And when I say three, will you just gently lift that hand to the Lord so I can pray? Ready? One, two, three. Lift it right now. Just lift it all over this place. It's all right. Don't be, you're among, you're among friends. Praise the Lord. Wow. Awesome. Leave those hands up. Now, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, seal this in the Holy Spirit. Plant these precious people in this house. And Lord, we mark this day as the first day of the rest of our lives. Father, bring every person back tonight. and Let this be a week of encouragement, of a prophetic picture of our future, and of exalting the word of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Say, I'll see you tonight at 7. And give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, pastor. Here we go. All right, just a couple of announcements before you take off. That was such a good close. Everyone's like, okay, we're out of here. <laughs> just got a couple moments. A um, few things coming up. Uh, yes, he mentioned it, 7 o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock tomorrow. Um, come expecting and uh, bring some people. If, if you know that God is going to move tonight, who do you want there to see it? Who do you want to experience um, the Holy Spirit's move. Let's invite them tonight. We'll be here. Um, there is child care um, or children's church, I should say. So that will be available. Um, this week we have growth track number three on Wednesday. Don't forget you can grab paper bulletins on your way out. The singles this, uh, the 21st, will be going to the zoo. Don't forget about that. And then the young adults have a meeting this coming Saturday, the 21st at 6 p.m. We're excited about that. Um, before we leave, we're going to sow. The Bible talks about sowing and reaping. We, we sow with our time. We sow with our finances. We sow all of those things. There's also a scripture that says that you are doing a good thing when you send the traveling ministers on with a gift. So... On top of our regular tithes and offerings, if you would like to sow into the ministry that Steve Hage just demonstrated before you guys and help him and his family go about and continue to, to spread the gospel in the way that he does, um, I want you to consider that and sow into that. You're doing a good thing when we do that above and beyond. Um, if you tend to give electronically, you'll notice there is a spot to give towards the guest speaker. So if you get on, if you're doing both, if you're going to tithe, and you'll have to do twice online. If you're doing it here in person with a check, you can just write the amount on the envelope that you want to go. You can write one check and say, you know, I want this to go to tithe and then this to go to, to him. If you're giving online, you'll need to do two separate gifts, but you can do that and you can select um, guest speaker and that will go towards them. We consider it a privilege to be able to be a part of what God is doing in him, through him, everywhere that he goes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to get together, to be inspired by your word, Lord, and to recognize the, the strategies that the enemy is using to try to derail us, to identify those, and then go forward and fulfill your purposes for our life. We thank you for it. Pray a blessing uh, today and uh, that your Holy Spirit would draw people to come tonight and to be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you guys tonight. God bless.